Facebook can that stuff that's important. Um, so we, we were just uh, talking about uh, uh, homework. If you didn't get a full point value, I'm just telling the group with the recording, if you didn't get a full point value, that means you didn't color, for example, or didn't use all the terms or so forth. And what you can do, uh, you just complete the work, read what I've wrote in the remarks and look through the rubric. The rubric explains what I like from you guys and it's mostly coloring, labeling, and then sometimes filling in some questions or lines. Uh, and then you can upload it again. And then I, uh, if you text me, I can see it right away and go in as quick as possible and regrade it or and give you all the points. And so it's not like you only if you only got four or six or however many of of the whole thing now means that's the final score. That is sort of a score in progress and it's working its way through. And uh, it's kind of like the busy work. The, the test is different than that, but that's this part and then what else were we talking about Janie um I forgot about the semester and if it's gonna get easier <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well this week was certainly the biggest week in terms of terminology this was a crazy in terms of terminology and so this week uh is 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 the that we had is the material for the test too and we will um I think the test two is open now, but it's open till I think July 10th or something like that. It's open for quite a while. Um, and so there's a lot of terms there. And then as we get now through the next sections, it becomes a little more physiology, a little more how things work and the less terminology in terms of studying the terms. Uh, but the other thing you have to always keep in mind is I am not asking you per se for memorizing those terms. I much rather have you try to understand the terms as much as possible because the tests are open book. And so if you organize your material, um, then you, and apply it, then it's, it's less about remembering the term. It's sort of a process, but I want you to remember it by a, being able to look it up because it's too much, too much material to just put into your brain uh, in that quick of a time frame. Another thing that's helpful is the studying, I think is, is also, um, is of course repetition, but it's also doing those exercises and spend time with the terminology and look at those cadaver videos that I laid behind and stuff like that. And organizing the material so you know where to look it up. Oh, and the other thing that I always think is very helpful is to slow it down and look at the verb per se. For example, if you see the term, trapezius you know that term is done by how the muscle looks like a trapeze in the geometric figure or um or or the serratus anterior i don't even know if that's actually on the list because serratus that comes from a serrated knife like a jigsaw knife and that's how it looks when you look at that or or the biceps muscles for example show you where it is it's in the it's in uh, the biceps brachii or the brachialis they are in the upper arm sort of section. So you can reference back to the chapter one where we looked at the regional terms. Uh, another uh, way that muscles are often indicated is, is like by their function, like you have in the forearm, you have the flexor muscles and then you have the extensor muscles. And that's, that's another way where you can kind of figure out where would it be, you know, what would a, a flexor that flexes the carpet, flexes the wrist, where would they be? Would they be in the forearm? or in the back of the arm. And since flexing is, is this motion, closing the angle, not extending it, bringing it back. So the flex is therefore would be in the front arm and not in the back arm and vice versa. And so those are sort of tricks over time that you can you know, learn to understand muscles versus just memorizing muscles. And the process of that for me is ultimately is slowing it down and not just reading over it. It's not like you're reading a novel. It's more like, um, um, you know, sort of meditating on the term a little bit and trying to understand it that way. Anyway, good morning, everybody. How are you all? Good morning. Any comments, any questions? It no good okay or everybody's overwhelmed this was certainly the big week from terminology perspective 
coming up is, is less terminology, is a little more function until we get to the brain next week. Then that's also a bunch of terms, but it's not like muscles. It's not as many as muscles. Um, I think the first thing I would like to do if there is no questions, and again, if you have questions, just speak up and interrupt me. Do not worry about holding up the hand because I'm going right into this section here. And you can see my screen. I had a question um, for test two. Is it like a picture or is it like a question or is it a mixture of both? No, it's a picture. Let's go right into that. Let's do right takes two. So in test two, and most of you guys did test one, which was due yesterday. A couple had technical problems and such. So I opened it again to Wednesday. So you can have to Wednesday to finish the first test uh, if you haven't been able to do that yet. But if I look through test number two, the first thing I want to do is make sure and we did that in last Zoom, but only about 13 people watched last Zoom. So I know we missed half the class who didn't get what we ever we talked then. Uh, so please, well, I don't have to tell you because you're on the call, but the others, please review the Zoom. Uh, so as we get to test two, I first want you to look at this term list. So if you look at the test review, I want you to if you can print out this, this list, this is all the terms that I'm using for test two. So this is all the terms combined from all the exercises that you had to label and color. And it's just a combined list. So there you have all the terms you need to know for the second test. So that's one thing that please do that. Then the second thing that depending on your studying habits and how you do it, flashcards are of course very important and very cool. Oh, and I'm, I will show you my tips again because there is something there for the flashcards. But other people, some people learn good by just watching videos and 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 learning the terms over and over. And so these videos all go through the term list um, and show the terms on the models that I use for the test. And then thirdly, and this might be taking a little too much ink to print, but you can at least use it on a uh, on a on a on a tablet or computer or so, but these are most of the models. I think all of the models have pictures, but not all the angles, uh, because I went through uh, right when the pandemic happened, and I probably missed a few. But if you, these are the models we use for the test. So what you can do is you can go through this list and be able to point to each muscle or each structure on the list on the model and that's probably then you're really prepared for the test i think if you can the, one, the ones the the pictures and the all the labeling and coloring from the labeling coloring in this test have the same you can put you can take the term list and put and find them all in the coloring exercise yes that's did, you, did you do some of that yeah i did all that that was super that that was the most helpful for me okay it's cool. pretty much yeah. it's the and same as did... those pictures the pictures of the models and the pics. I mean, at the end of the day, you have the same views, quote unquote, the same like right angles on the almost on the labeling and coloring. If you place all the terms from the term list onto the label coloring exercise, then you you, you get it. You, you should get yeah. You get something good in your hands. Yeah, yeah, and you you finished that test already, and you did really well on it. So take that, guys. Take that to heart. It's a lot about repetition. It's a lot about remembering and pulling the term out of your head or, or where it is. And, and, and that part is the studying part. That's a little bit painful to do that. That's why a lot of people shy away and just want to read over and over, but that doesn't do anything for your brain. That's just numbing it out. And a lot of us are a little bit ADD and a little scattered, especially with all the devices around. And so it's very easy to just zone out when we do that. So in make the, yourself some questions, make yourself some exercises. In the middle of last week, I, uh, I realized that doing the labeling and some of the coloring before the question while I was watching the videos was very, very helpful. Well, and, well, and how was the cadaver videos for you? Did you watch those too? No, I didn't watch the cadaver videos. Okay, I, just, I, yeah. I mean, some of it, I guess the complicated ones, some of it, some of the, the leg muscles were a little more helpful in the cadaver videos. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but while while I'm watching the first, the, every chapter has two parts. There's four, three or four short videos and one long video. 
I do the three short video with the coloring exercise in front of me. So there's something to watch, something to almost something to touch. And then I put names and I take notes on those. And then I color them. Then I answer the questions. And then you can watch the long. If you, if there's something that appears like not clear, you'll know if you get it or if you don't by the time you you're playing with the the, the coloring exercise. And you can watch the long lecture. That's helped me a lot. I and that's a, a really great way. That's a real because you kind of make a kinesthetic exercise of it. You really work the material versus just passively sitting there and absorbing it. Professor, I, I watched the cadaver videos and I found them really helpful. Oh, good. I'm glad. So all that work was for, was for something. <laughs> no, I, I thought, um, yeah, they, they, they helped a lot. I noticed that the, um, they weren't available for all the different parts of the muscle groups, but the ones that they were available for, like the shoulder and such, was very helpful for me. Good, good. Yeah, I, I, I actually cropped them from a long, long video from a DVD uh, uh, that was done by the Surgical Corporation of America. So these are pretty high-end things. Uh, and then I actually did all of them like that for my own review. And then at some point I figured it might be helpful for you guys too. Yep. And it is, if you can handle looking at cadavers, but since it's anatomy, you know, we, we might, and it's not like gross, it's just very specific uh, where they want to show. The other thing that I think is somewhat helpful or was for me when I studied it, I think I actually got this when I studied it. When you look at the muscles, I think it's in the trunk muscles under the, under the um, study tips. These are all the clips of the cadavers that when he was just talking about, but I also put them in the bullet points. And then this is a flash card picture. These are pictures of individual muscles, not the first two pages, but these like the pec minor here, individual muscles that you can cut out, put on a flash card, color, and have a little do with something with that you're spending some time with the, with the uh, material. The same as when you have to write down origin and insertion and action, that is all meant for you guys to spend a little time with the muscle and go like, you know, and that way it sinks more in. For the test, you only need to give me the name. You don't need to give me origin, insertion or action, just the name. You need to be able to recognize it. But as an exercise, it helps to remember better when you do all these things with it. And the other thing on that is make sure you also don't have to do everything. Part of this process is figuring out what works for you. It's just um, the important part is to try things out and be a little gung ho and spend some spend some time with it. I know it's a lot of work uh, and a lot of material, but do the best you can, and then you find out by from yourself what works best for you. And that's uh, like, like the learning pyramid, for example, can help you with that a little bit. All right, any other comments or questions to this, how the test two works? Oh, uh, uh, let me show you one question so you can see how I'm asking it, what I'm asking. I'll give you one question for free. Oh, and I have to get out of the student view. No, it's the, open. It's the open. questions are very clear. The answers are hard to find, but the questions are clear. I, I, as far as I, I felt, there's a little. Yeah, and and it's it. partly because you have to actually write in the question, the answer. You don't. It's not a multiple choice. And so what I'm asking on this test is I'm asking for three things. I'm asking for full bones, like this is the frontal bone, for example, and then I'm asking for landmarks, and landmarks are part of the bone. And so here, for example, this first one points right between the eyebrows and that's the glabella. And so you have a picture showing it and then you have a video that I'm pointing it out. It's like 15 seconds or so. And then these are external links just in case somehow the browser don't, doesn't pick it up. It used to be that Safari didn't work that well, but I think now it's fine. I think they changed that. And then what you do is you go onto the list of terms, this list, and you look, where is that label? Where is that thing? And actually, I'm going fairly OK in sequence. It's not scrambled. I try to make it as straightforward as possible because it is a lot of material. And you're asked to do a lot of terminology. But again, focus on understanding it and organizing your material versus simply memorizing it. I know anatomy is a lot of memorization, but it's also the least helpful at the end of the day, because if you just memorize it and then do the test, you'll be 
you know, not remembering much of it. Anatomy more works to me. It more works like if you if this is your first anatomy class, you're being exposed to the material the first time, and then every time you learn it again. That's why there's a 20 AB or a bio two uh, class, a, a higher level class, which goes through the same stuff again. It just might present it in a way that then you have to remember the origin and the insertion for the test versus just the, or you maybe you get nerve supply innervation, which we didn't even talk about in this class. And so it's, it's layered. So if you go away and you think, oh my God, I don't remember any of this afterwards. No, you do. You just, maybe it's unconscious. And next time you're exposed to it again, you much easier can learn it. And then you learn it deeper. So be aware of that. Don't, don't, don't um, feel too bad. I mean, that is part of this class being so fast paced. It does set us up for feeling like we don't get it because it's so much material, but you do get a lot. I mean, a lot of your work that I've been grading is excellent. It's very, very good work. And you, I really see the work that you put in. So I'm very, very proud of all of you. All right, let's do this, go out of here. Any questions? No, good. What else? Um, oh, the Padlets, I went through most of the, answered most of the Padlets. Make sure please to sign into Padlet with your Peralta uh, in, sign in, because that way we can, I can see who is doing it or we can all talk to each other other than being anonymous. Um, and I can actually give you, give you a score for it. Because the first week I gave everybody five points. I just try to do that as courtesy. But now I give people points that do post, not everybody. So it's not just a freebie from that perspective. So I do want you to reflect on what's happy. going on. Plus it helps me also. It helps you each other because like Raphael, you put on a great little cartoon clips, which are really fun to watch because it's like, you know, how much better is it learning with having some fun with it? Um, and then I got some other great videos that were posted in there. And please check those out. You know, that's how we can help each other. I'd be happy to show again how to log in. If, if anyone's interested, I can share my screen and show. Yeah, do that real quick. Let me get out of here. Yeah, yeah, do that real quick, please. Because I think that was very helpful. You did that. Share screen. How do I do that? Share screen. Let me see where I am here. Bottom. I think it should be on the bottom. Yeah, I got it. There we go. Here. I know they changed it. I oh tricked me out yesterday. I think it goes over canvas down here. Oh, wow. See there on the right side is email and then canvas. Click on that. That's oh, where I went in. There we go. I'm sorry. That, I didn't. It's all right. It's all right. No worries. Am I in canvas now? Hmm. I think you go first through Microsoft and the apps and oh, then you wow. click on Canvas. I know it's a double step for some reason. Okay. Hello, Canvas. Otherwise, I'll just... Here we go. There you go. Try Sorry, it. Guys. That's all right. It's hanging it up, huh? What's going on? Otherwise, let me do it. Yeah, my... Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll, oh, that's cool. I'll that's cool. This is, this is um, awesome. now, now I need to log into my class. <laughs> I know. Now I first go figure out how to do that, huh? Uh, where's the Padlets? Oh, I have it here. I, I, so what you do is you go in the Padlet in the... Um, I got it if you want it. Oh, you got it? Yeah, go yeah. for it. Go for it. Hold on. Let me... Let me there we go. Okay. So... You find you the model that you want to do. So that would be the two questions and tips. Once you get to that Padlet page here, that little box over here is the one you want to click. Click on that little box, it's going to open external. And then on top of here, there should be a login button. If not, there's a little box here. And you can either well, I'll log out and I'll log back in just to show you. There you go. So there's a little button here that says login. You log in with Microsoft, and if you saved your Peralta logins, it's logging you. You can put a picture, you can put your picture on, and now all the posts you do are, for example, you. Yeah. There's my name here. 
So now when I make a post, you can see, I mean, some of you did it. That's all. And I, I hope that helps. Perfect. Yeah, see, there's a the video. Watch that one. Oh. The cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, the yeah, cartoons yeah. are surprisingly very good. It's, a, it's like, I don't, anyway. I, I was surprised how accurate they are for cartoons. You would yeah, think, the, you know. the material for kids, and but it, it's surprisingly good. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's incredible. The, the one on the, on the genome, the one, there's, there's, there's some on the heart. There's, it's, it's almost like they took an anatomy class and make a cartoon out of it. It's, it's, they did. It seems like to me. No, it was fantastic. Um, and I was really impressed, uh, you know, there that the French certainly got it with that. It's not just Louis de Finet, huh, Raphael. <laughs> it's also that one. Uh, definitely not. Okay. Anyway, so um, if there's no other questions to that, so the Padlet um, is good to go in. And then, oh, and, and when I do um, label, I mean, when I correct your work, I look for completion. I look for what I'm asking you, but I'm not able, other than I'm killing myself, uh, go through every term individually. And so make sure, because I have so many videos up for everything, make sure that you also watch those videos. Because sometimes, especially if people use like half the terms or they use other terms that are not on the list, I'm like, hello, read the instructions, please. And I'm not going to be willing to do extra work and run after everybody. That's you guys' work in college. You have to do that. In high school, it was probably different. But we can argue about the American high school system till the cows come home. I don't have to worry about that, doing that. So just be aware of that. But for most of you, you get great work. Um, and most of them is just they didn't color it or so, so they have to go back. So now we are in week three. We have five weeks of material. Week three is, if you have the booklets, it's booklet number four. Uh, basically, it's the heart, the vessels, the blood vessels and the blood, the immune system, the endocrine system, which is the hormones and the integumentary system. Um, and be aware, test two will be open till July 10th, but the material is finished this week. So the material was just the muscles and the bones. And so um, also time yourself. July 10th, that's pretty far out. Next Sunday is what? The first week. Of, so you have two more weeks to take this test. If you wait till the end, I give you till the end of these two weeks because I want to uh, 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 you know, be able for people to be flexible, but don't fool yourself. Don't go through all the new material and then go back because you're afraid of taking the test. Be a little on top of that because right now the material is on top of that. On the muscle bone material is sort of in your forefront. Uh, you might want to study it a little more, organize it a little more, watch those review videos a few times, but then take the test and just jump in. And the other thing I do need to still say about this test is. Um, it's graded, it's auto graded in the system. That's just how it works. Uh, but if you misspell a term, it's going to come back as, as incorrect. And so after you take the test, you got my go like, oh my God, I missed all these things. But what I do is every test I go back and I hand grade it. Um, and, and most of you guys get, you know, five to 10 more points just because of misspellings and stuff like that. Now, of course, you can't come back and say, like, I misspelled it, but it spelled something else, then that won't work. But, you know, just do the best you can and try not to freak out if your score looks lower than you thought it should look. Give me a couple of days and I'm grading it and then we can have that discussion afterwards. Um, anyway, so this week we're going to go through the heart. And when we go into the heart, we start, you know, big where is it located in the chest wall uh, what it's what is its um, uh, uh, location between the lungs it's very well embedded it's very cushioned it's protected and then we also look at the protections around the heart now this is very interesting this 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 serous membrane system we find that in the heart we find that in the lung we also find that system in the gut um and in the heart well, in the, in the heart, it sort of protects the heart from having too much friction because the heart muscle pumps the whole time. And if you have that surrounded by just other organs, you're going to create a lot of friction. And that over a lifetime, of course, will create inflammation and all that kind of stuff that we don't want. And so what we have here, we have a system that, 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 that is a, 
an enclosed membrane. It's like a two layer membrane, but it's enclosed. So it's really one membrane that is like, you can visualize a balloon and you stick your fist into it and you have the two, the two, you know, one part of the balloon is around the fist and the other part is on the outside. And the same is here. One part is around the heart and the one part is around the chest wall. And in between that, we have a fluid, a very watery type fluid that decreases friction. And so that's um, interest, an interesting system when uh, it comes to protection of the heart. In the lungs, we also have that protection, but we also have it be the means of how the lungs are attached to the chest wall. And breathing doesn't help happen by your lungs breathing actively. What happens is the chest wall rises and the diaphragm goes down and that increases the chest cavity and the lungs are attached to the chest wall. And so therefore it creates a suction and the air gets sucked into the lungs. And so the action that so that's what it does there. And in the abdominal abdominal area, it 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 organizes the gut. It holds the gut in place because you got this long skinny tube and you got to put it in his stomach area, and it has to be very well organized that it doesn't get twisted and and creates um, knots where the food can't go you know through. And that of course will make the body be toxic because the inside of the gut is kind of like the outside of the world. It's not really the inside of the body. If you think about it. the gut is attached to the mouth and the anus and everything going through is it has a connection to the outside world. So you're going to have bacteria in there and all kinds of stuff. And if, for example, an appendix burst in somebody, you have to be extremely fast and careful that you the, the inside of the body does not get toxic. And if that's too long left alone, even though it's a fairly minor thing, it's going to kill you because the body is going to get um, uh, poisoned that way. So from there, we talk a little bit about the heart walls, the heart muscle, and then the other layers. You can learn about that. And then we get into a little bit of talk about the blood vessel. We talk about the difference between an artery and a vein and then a capillary. But basically the discussion there is that that Arteries, when we look at arteries in a system, they also, they, they're often colored red and veins are colored blue. And that is because arteries are generally holding blood that has more oxygen on the hemoglobin. And that appears a little bit more reddish than the scarlet red, which is, which is when the blood is deoxygenated. Um, but in terms of the definition, an artery is named after the vessels that leave the heart and a vein are vessels that come back to the heart. And the reason why we make that distinction differentiation is because the anatomy uh, is generally the same setup. We have the same amount of layers, but the arteries are much differently structured and composed in terms of how much collagen, for example, is or how much muscles is in the artery because they have to withstand that hydrostatic pressure where the blood gets pumped into those vessels via the heart and a vein just sort of has to guide the blood back to the heart. It doesn't have to withstand those pressures. So it's a little bit different that way. And so the definition, you have it right here, arteries are move away from the heart, veins move to the heart, from the body back to the heart. And then capillaries are, capillaries are those vessels in between that actually do the exchange of blood and of gases and of, of nutrients and all that kind of stuff and, and feed the muscles and all the other tissues with that stuff so that's a good one there and then we go into the heart chambers and we basically look at eat the heart is two pumps in one so you got you can sort of cut the heart in half right here and you've got a left a right side of the heart and the left side of the heart the right side of the heart pumps the blood from the body to the lungs so that's why you see here you got pulmonary this is actually a place where this is a blue vessel and it's called an artery. And that is not a mistake because this vessel moves away from the heart. And so that way, that for, for that reason, the walls of that vessel are thicker and are differently composed than the ones that feed the blood to the heart, which are these blue vessels. On the right side of the heart, that's a little mixed up. On the left side of the heart, uh, the, the red and no, see, on the left side of the heart, these are vessels that bring the blood from the lungs to the heart. And these are veins, even though they're red color, because they're fully oxygenated blood. 
And so that's why they call it in red. So the color does not necessarily go with the, with the term Aurean vein. It just most of the time works that way. This is where it doesn't work that way. Just be aware of that. So when we go to the chambers, we have a heart has a four chamber, that's an atrium, and that's where the blood comes in. And then we have a main chamber, and, and, and that's also known as an ejection chamber. So this is a receiving chamber where the blood, it's like in a, a four room before you enter the full house in an old European house, I guess, mostly, um, um, or in, where it's cold areas, where it's cold. Um, and so the heart, the blood first accumulates here, and then this squeezes a little bit and pumps all the blood into the into the main chamber, the ejection chamber, and then from there it goes into the vessels that leave the heart. And so we call this the atrium and this the ventricle. And we got one on both sides. The other thing that's interesting here is you see how this heart wall here is quite thin compared to this wall right here. And so the reason for that is um, that this heart. This, this right side of the heart just has to pump the blood from the heart to the lungs. The left heart has to pump the blood through the whole body. So the left side of the heart has to do a stronger contraction to get the blood pumped that through the whole body and not just to the lungs, which are right next door, basically. So that's about what I think is there most important. And then we talk about valves and the valves, actually, let me go back to the chambers. The valves, we have two sets of valves. And the valves make sure the blood doesn't have backflow. So for example, we have a valve between the four chamber, the atrium and the ventricle. And when that valve closes, when that heart contracts, sorry, those valves close up to assure that the blood doesn't go back and get pumped back into the four chamber. That will be insufficient. That would be a problem. And that's when we have murmurs. And sometimes those valves are leaky depending on pathology or congenital. Um, and um, they can be insufficient. The second set of valves is uh, at the exit place of the ejection chamber. And as you can see how those valves sort of go upward, they're little leaves, the semilunar uh, valves, and they, they let the blood go out, push those valves open, but then the blood cannot fall back into that chamber. And so it prevents that from happening. So the valves make sure, the heart valves make sure, and this is a picture from above. So you took the atria off and you look down into the ventricles. And so those valves assure uh, that there's no backflow. And then the rest of this stuff just talks about the details of it, which is very interesting. I'm sure you're gonna get through it. And then we have a cardiac cycle or circuits and, and, um, and that shows us the pathway of the blood as it goes through the heart. And so you learn a little bit about that. We have a pulmonary circuit that brings the, actually that's here, that brings uh, the blood from the, is this mistaken here? Anyway, can't do the details right now. The pulmonary circuit brings the blood from the heart to the lungs. And then we have the systemic circuit and that brings the blood to the rest of the body. So those are the two sided heart of the sides of the heart, what they do. And then we have a little spiel about the vessels that feed the heart. The interesting thing there is that the blood that goes through the heart does not give the heart the nutrients and the oxygen it needs to do the work. We have a second system of vessels from the outside that feed the heart muscles itself. And those vessels come right off the aorta where it's very oxygenated blood. And it's the, the pathway that brings the heart to the rest of the body. Um, and that's where we siphon off some of the heart just to feed the heart muscle itself. So we have a few vessels there that we need to study and know the terms of. And then from there, we go into the physiology. And you will see, you know, here the terminology is not that vast as with the muscles. What's going to be bigger is the physiology. And the physiology of the heart, one of the things that's very interesting about the heart, it has its own nervous system. So the heart in itself pumps on, pumps on its own. It doesn't need the brain to tell it to pump. Most body functions in a body is the brain needs to tell the body what to do. That can be conscious. When you think of brain, the smallest part of the brain is your consciousness, is the thinking part. Most of the brain is unconscious. And so the unconscious part coordinates all those body functions thank, that's, that thank the Lord we don't have to think about like breathing depth or breathing speed or 
or, or modifying the heart muscles contraction. That's also done by the brain, et cetera, et cetera. But the heart itself has its own nervous system. So the heart pumps about 70, 60 to 70 times per minute on its own. And you can see that when, when, when you know, sometimes uh, when an animal gets killed or so, or I, I saw a fishing thing and they actually take the heart out and it still has some pumping going on. It still does that. It still has enough energy to do that work until it dies out, until the oxygen goes away and it doesn't have any ATP left. So that's kind of an interesting part about the heart. You learn about details on that. And then we're going to study a little bit about that very famous electrocardiogram picture. What is what? And essentially, um, the heart has is the two phasic system. It's a contraction and then a relaxation. But then a contraction when it squeezes the blood out and a relaxation when it fills up with blood. And we call that systole and diastole. The systole is the contraction, the diastole is the relaxation. You probably know that from the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure is the higher number and the diastolic is the lower number. And so what we measure is the electrocardiogram, we measure the electrical output, the electricity that happens with those events. And so the first little bump here that we get is when the atria contract a little bit to squeeze all the blood from those, the receiving chambers, the atria into the ventricle, which are then the ejection chamber. And then this big spike here is when the, when the um, ventricles contract. So that's the ventricular depolarization it's called. Depolarization is when it's like a discharge of the energy. Repolarization, which is this T wave that we can also see that is a recharging of the energy. So it's kind of like, um, you know, when you see somebody do a, do a, do a, the, the re try to restart the heart with those um, electrodes and all that, you, you, it first has to charge up the battery and then it can discharge and let go and try to restart that heart. It's the same thing with our nervous system. When we discharge and make an electrical impulse, that means in the body, that means a lot of ions have to cross the cell membranes and, and get scrambled around from a chemical perspective in order to create that charge. And that's depolarization. And the repolarization part is when that charge gets rebuilt, when all the ions get put back into their proper place to then be able to discharge again. And so that's that T wave that we see where the ventricles, this big discharge is being recharged, is being repolarized as they call that. Um, and obviously the, the P wave is the depolarization, the discharge of the atria. And the question then is, well, where is the repolarization of the atria? And that's hidden behind this bigger spike that takes over. So there is also a repolarization of those nerves. We just can't see it on the, on the graph. Anyway, that was that. And then from there, we do talk about this systole, systole and diastole. And uh, I just mentioned what those are. The, the, the systole is the pumping and the diastole is the filling up of blood. And then we get into the heart sounds and that's that looped up, looped up, looped up. And what is that? And basically the heart sounds are closings of the, of the, um, of the, of the, the flaps, uh, closing of the heart valves. And so that makes a little bit of a sound. And so the, the first, the lup is the AV valve closing. That's the atrioventricular valves. AV stands for atrioventricular. And again, atrium is the receiving chamber, ventricle, the ejection chamber. So it's between those two. So that's the first sound. And then the second sound, the dub, is when the valves that guard the exit point of the ejection chambers and when, when the heart finishes squeezing the blood out, and then when some of the blood falls back onto them and that closes those valves and that's that second sound. So you learn about that more. And then from there we have, we do the cardiac cycle and that just goes through one heart, one of those 60 to 70 beats per minute that the heart um, pumps. So it just talks, talks it through what happens with the filling up with the blood going from the atria to the ventricle and then uh, the ejection of the blood and then the relaxation again. So you go through that part. And then lastly, here we describe the 
cardiac output and that's how much blood can be pumped by in one minute. And of course that varies greatly. What's interesting here is that we can, um, we can, we can go from about five liters a minute, a liter, a, a gallon is what 3.6 liters, I think. So, uh, they, you know, in science, thank God for us, some of us, it's all done in metrics. Um, um, <laughs> thank, so God. thank God, indeed. Well, you know, the problem really is, I know it's really a pain for so many of you that you have to learn the metric from the non-metric or whatever it's called. But at the end of the day, it's really all counting in tens versus having to figure out what is an eighth of an inch and so forth. And so at the end, from a scientific perspective, it does make it much more linear as a system. And so I'm sorry that you, you have to learn it and it's not just given to you intrinsically, but that's one of my you know, complaints about America, but never mind, that's a different topic. Um, anyway, we, we have a heart that at rest pumps about five liters, a little more than a gallon per minute. And that number is made up by how much blood does it pump per pumping time? And then how many times does it pump per minute? And, what, and here we can go from that resting, just laying, and then we can run around like crazy and really need a lot of blood going through the body to be able to perfuse and give all those muscles the energy. And the heart can pump up to 25 liters per minute, which is five times as much, which is really significant. It can keep that up for long, but that's, um, that's pretty cool stuff. And so you see how flexible that um, system actually is. So that will close out the heart. And then from there, we go to the blood vessels. And in the blood vessels, we talk again about the um, difference between the arteries and the veins. And then here we actually look a little bit more in detail what the differences are between the vessel walls. Um, and so you can learn about that. Um, we talk about, wait a minute, there. Oh, and then we, we talk about the different, the diff then we talk about the arteries per se. And when there we talk about, you know, the artery that leaves the heart, the great vessel, the aorta is a different construction than the artery that let's say siphons blood from the aorta which goes from the heart up and then goes down into the through the stomach area and the gut um, um and and then from there the blood gets siphoned up to the different organs like the kidneys or the gonads or the stomach or the liver and and those arteries are more muscular than the one the aorta the aorta has a lot of collagen fibers because it has to be very stretchy so when the blood pumps, it sort of stretches and then it recoils a little bit, which in itself pumps the blood forward through the vessels, which is a very interesting dynamic, but it doesn't have to have as much muscle tissue as let's say the, most, the, the arteries that siphon the blood off from the aorta, because the muscle is here to be able to figure out how much blood does an organ need at, need at that time, and it can constrict it a little more or dilate it a little more. Constriction means it makes the lumen smaller. The lumen is the inside where the blood flows, or dilating, it makes it a little bigger. Um, and then obviously, uh, uh, it, it brings more, more or less blood to uh, those organs. And so those arteries are more muscular because that can control the size of the lumen, the, the, the space on the inside, the hose. Is this, when, is, this why, is this why when we work out, veins are more visible? In the arm, for example, let's say, are you doing... You know, I, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's because, yeah, you have more blood going through those muscles and the veins are pretty boggy. They're pretty like uh, loose skinned. And so the blood, more blood going through them will push them open more. Because they're basically, veins are most like mostly guiding vessels that bring the blood back to the heart. So they don't have as much, they don't have as much muscle tissue. See, they have much little muscle tissue here and they have other structures. They have like valves. And so, when, you know, the, so the blood coming back from the legs back to the heart go, and they go to muscles a lot. So the blood coming back from the legs up to the heart, the blood just doesn't always fall back down. It has these valves that hold it in there. And then once the muscle contracts, it pump, the block gets pumped a little bit further up and so forth and gets guided back to the heart. Because we only have one heart. We don't have all these little hearts that keep pumping it. it looks but like that's, a, that's a reason why we, we often need muscle contraction. And when you don't have enough muscle contraction, you will, um, 
uh, sorry, uh, Rafa, you you uh, you you will the blood will pool, and sometimes the guards like at the at the palace uh, in England or or in Rome uh, by the by the Pope, uh, those those guards keel over because they're standing still for that long and they don't have muscle function. I mean, they don't use their muscles. What are you gonna say, Rafael? No, just, nothing. It looks like a Tesla valve. I'll put it. I'll put it on the link. Oh, cool, cool. All right. So that is arteries, and then a little bit of veins, and then the capillaries are are leaky vessels. Uh, so they only have a, basically one layer of all the layers that the vest that the arteries and the veins have, and they have to be leaky because that's the um, the place that goes through the organs that needs to perfuse the organs with blood and so the blood in the capillaries the blood leaks out of the vessel system or most of the blood components and then at the beginning of the organ or the tissue it perfuses and then at the end of the tissue that it perfuses it comes back into the venous system and the, and 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 then of course the blood goes back to the heart for reoxygenation in the lungs uh, and what we do there is control mechanisms we don't have muscles around the capillaries because that would make them less leaky but we have these sphincters and the sphincters are these round muscles um, and we can open or close those sphincters depending on how much this area needs to be perfused and that is measured in the system uh, multiple ways but one way is by measuring the uh, carbon dioxide con carbon dioxide content uh, and then if the carbon dioxide content is high then we know that that area of tissue needs to be perfused with more blood and more bring more oxygen to the area because carbon dioxide is the byproduct from using oxygen to make an energy make an atp all right, and from there, we just have a little bit talking about the main arteries and the main veins. And you can see here how the big aorta, the aorta first goes up, then it makes an arch, and then it goes down, and it's known as the descending here. And it goes down all the way to the lumbar region where it splits into the vessels that then go into the legs. And from those, we all get these vessels coming off and feeding the different organs. You're feeding these kidneys, for example. Um, is the renal vessel and feeding the gonads, the testicles and the ovaries is the, is the gonadal or the mesenteric is the, is the what feeds the gut. That one is a different word. Most of those terms are really kind of great because look here, for example, you've got the vessels that feed the arm. You've got one here. That's the axillary artery. I don't even see it. Oh, here, it's the axillary artery because that's right in the axilla. That's your armpit. And... They could say armpit artery, but they don't. But uh, or or you have the brachial artery. You see here brachial artery. That's the artery that's in the upper arm, and it's the same artery. It just changes its name by where it travels through. And as it gets into the forearm, we split the artery in half, and we have a radial by the radius. The radius always goes to the thumb, or then the ulnar artery, which goes to the pinky. Um, and and so they are named very often by where they travel through. Down here, we have the femoral by the femur. We have the tibial or the fibular, depending on the bone it travels through. And so as you go through these names, um, I, don't have, I don't have you memorize all these names uh, because of the naming system is so um, similar to the regions of the body system that we already studied. But I want you to familiarize yourself with it as we um, as you go through the material, just because, yeah, if you go to an upper level anatomy class, you probably will have to memorize those names more. And the same is true with the veins, same naming, brachial, axillary, cephalic is the head. Oh, this is, this is one place where the veins and the arteries are different. The veins have come in deep veins and superficial veins when we look at the system. And the deep veins go through muscle tissue. So those are the ones that are named brachial, axillary, ulnar, radial, the same names as the arteries have. But then we also have some vessels that are superficial. Those are the ones that pop out when we do push-ups, for example. Um, and, and those are more underneath the skin. Those are also the ones that we can take blood from, like here, the cubital. You see, if you see it very faintly, you can see that the, the superficial veins are not as deeply blue, but it's very difficult to see that. Um, but main names that we don't recognize easy, like basilic veins or 
um, or uh, down in here is the um, saphenous veins. Those are superficial veins. They actually use the saphenous vein to do hard bypasses in case we have clogged arteries. So the veins and the arteries are similar enough in makeup that they can pull that, that vein out and use it for repairing the heart muscle. So that's pretty cool there. Um, so as it comes to naming the veins, that's when you see names and go like, heck, I don't understand that name at all. Then most likely it's a, it's a superficial vein and not a deep vein. And then from there, we talk briefly about the lymphatic system. And when you look at the, the heart and the blood vessels and then the blood squeezes out uh, into the tissue, it's easy to squeeze out the blood. How the heck do you bring that fluid back into the veins? That's a difficult question. And a lot of that is done by osmosis. And remember when we talked about the, the cells, osmosis is kind of like a partic particle pull for fluid. So you, you visualize you cut a tomato and put some salt on top. And before you know it, instead of salt crystals, you got little water droplets. And so the salt pulls out the water out of the tomato. So that's where you can see how osmosis works in, in a real life example. And the body does a similar thing when it squeezes out the blood from um, through the capillaries. The capillaries are thin enough that, or, or, or strong enough that the, or the filter is small enough that the larger particles, particular proteins like albumin, for example, stay behind in the capillaries. And at the end of the capillary bed, they can be used like the salt crystals in the tomato to pull the fluid back and bring the um, blood back into um, the venous system. But it's not as efficient as getting, you know, squeezing it out of the veins or out of the capillaries. And so what we have is we have a second system, a lymphatic system, and that picks up a lot of the inner the fluid that is left behind that hasn't been brought back into the veins. And that's what the lymphatics do. The other thing that the lymphatics do is, is we know that from cancer, um, it, it has, a, a, well, we don't know that from cancer, but we have a lot of immune function in lymph nodes, for example, which are aggregates of white blood cells that, um, and other stuff, but that sit along the pathways. And so you can, when somebody gets sick, for example, you go to the doctor, you have a head cold, they palpate these lymph nodes here and they can see if they're swollen. And if they're swollen, that means there is some pathology in your system. Um, and most likely it's a cold, but the immune system is activated and is fighting it. And so that's one place where we can sort of understand why do they do that? The other thing that, of course, the negative that the lymphatic system does, it can spread cancer through the body. And that's when we um, have a stage two to stage three, I think it is when it infects the lymph nodes or not. So that's when they test for that. All right, and then from there, lastly, what we do is blood pressure. And the blood pressure is the pressure that the blood exudes onto the walls of the arteries and the veins. And we measure that. And so we measure that by squeezing an artery and the blood pumps, and it creates a turbulence in the blood flow if the blood, if the vessel is just opening a little bit. First, nothing gets through, but as soon as we hear a sound that the blood pressure cough is let go a little bit, it creates a turbulence and that turbulence makes a sound. And that's the higher number. That's the sound the blood makes when it forces its way through the vessel. So that's when the heart contracts. And so that's the systolic blood pressure. Systole again is heart muscle contraction. And then, and then, and then uh, we, we hear when we do the, the blood pressure taking, we hear the sound, shoo, 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 and at some point it gets fainter and it goes away. And when it goes away, that's the last moment that the turbulence is created when the muscle is not pumping, when it's relaxing, because it's not as forceful at that point. And so that's then the diastolic blood pressure. And so we can then measure both top, top number and bottom number and that gives us these two numbers that we then look at and say like, well, that's a little bit too high or that's just about right. And so when we look at broad pressure, the norm is the 120 over 80 and these are millimeters of mercury. It's just our measurement stick. And, and as we get into the 140 over 90, we call it hypertension. And then, you know, depending on, on 
what we do, that's when we sometimes have to start taking medicine or actually also do lifestyle changes because blood pressure can be very heavily influenced by lifestyle changes. It just depends if people want to stop drinking and smoking or not and want to go walking around and eat less fatty stuff and more salads. Um, but, but that's when the medical system sort of gets in, comes and intervenes. But do not take my word for all this stuff. Always talk to your medical doctor if you have to worry about high blood pressure. And again, if you have questions to speak into me, don't hesitate because then we go right into blood. And blood is, uh, is a connective tissue. It's a fluid connective tissue. It's the same connective tissue as bone. Um, I mean, it's also a connective tissue like bone. Uh, whereas they're looking completely different and they feel completely different, but they have the same components. And in bone, the, 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 um, well, in blood, the cellular components are red, white blood cells and also platelets. And, and the extracellular matrix is basically plasma, which is basically water, a little altered water and then fibers and in bone the fibers are collagen fibers and the blood plasma is not plasma there it's not liquid it's solid calcium um, um, deposits and so that's where that different look comes in so connective tissue is a very wide range of tissues that's why in some ways talking about it early on always irritated me especially when you have to look through slides and before you even know how anything works you have to be able to indicate that this tissue comes from this and so forth so I just don't even worry about teaching it that deep. You could do that in bio too, look at microscopes. All right, so that's the blood components. When we look at the functional blood, it of course, the big thing we know about is oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. So it brings oxygen to the tissues. Oxygen is vital because it makes, helps us make ATP. So if we don't have blood, no oxygen, no ATP, death, that's sort of the, you know how it goes and that can be tissue death but if it goes to the brain after a few minutes that also means death of our body and so it's very very important that that oxygen gets to the tissues and that's where even posture comes in i mean they have found there was a cardiologist in boston and he has figured out and and he was a surgeon and he has figured out when when the patients lay crooked with their head when they get surgery and he opens up the vessels the blood doesn't go into the brain but when they are sitting up straight or you know, laying straighter, when they get surgery, the blood goes to the brain. And so when you're sitting totally crooked and you're falling more and more into the chair, when you study, be aware that your brain doesn't get the same amount of oxygen and nip yourself in the butt and sit up straight for a little bit or take a break, which is probably a reason you should take a break if, if it starts being slouchy and walk around a little bit or do something completely different. Uh, for a moment. So besides oxygen, we also um, have immune system cells, white blood cells going through the um, blood, uh, through the blood, in, is in the blood. We talk about that in the immune. No, look at that. We talk about that here in a minute. Um, and then the other thing that goes through the blood, of course, is a lot of dissolved substances like nutrients, like metabolic waste, like hormones as well, for example. Um, and so we have all of those things go through the blood. Medicine looks, our modern medicine is very heavily looking at blood as you know indicators for disease and what can we do about it and so forth. Other, other medical professions like chiropractic, for example, has much more heavy a emphasis on the nervous system, for example, and also makes the connection between the immune system and a proper functioning nervous system. And so that's something that is really difficult for us to understand because we're so heavily guided into, into what modern medicine tells us is. But there's many things that compromise good health and what can we do about something when we have a thing, a disease, for example. And so that's just food for thought. Uh, uh, it might be a little difficult to understand. It took me years to really get that. Um, the other thing that functions of blood happens is, 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 is blood has a good amount of, of to do with heat distribution uh, in the body. So for example, when it's really cold outside, 
and your fingers are starting to fall off, that is because the blood who gives warmth through the organs will be going through the internal organs because they are more important to survive for our organism than a finger is. If we lose a pinky finger, the body doesn't, I mean, it's painful and all that, but the body from a being surviving perspective doesn't really care as much. And one more thing that happens in blood that's important is the coagulation process. And because sometimes blood vessels break and we have to be able to stop that breakage, to stop that leakage that happens when the hose is having a hole or is broken. And so the clotting is very important. Um, it's, it's also very delicate because if it's done wrong, it creates clumping in the blood and then that can lead to strokes. And so that's a very delicate process that we actually, I think, have a whole section on. We don't go that much into detail because it's a really complicated step-by-step -step process. And I drive myself crazy just always remembering it. Anyway, then we go deeper into the different blood cells, the red blood cells, and he talks about hemoglobin and what that does how the life cycle is, where they're made. So that's pretty interesting, but fairly straightforward. And then the leukocytes are the white blood cells and they have to do with the immune system. And so we talk about the different white blood cells and we have five different types that we discuss. Um, the, they're separated into granulocytes and A granulocytes. And that just means when they stay in them, they have little granules that show up, little dots in them that uh, you can see that on the homework when we go through the different ones there are little dots on some of them and so that is that differentiation is simply done by how they look under the microscope not really what they do uh, but we're gonna talk about what they do are we gonna talk about that again oh details duh so we have all of them listed and and sort of give an overview of what they do, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils. I know that's a bunch of new words again. And then the lymphocytes and then the monocytes. And so you can get through that in here. So it's pretty interesting stuff, but you know, you, you will be asked to know the names and I want you to sort of know one or maybe one or two things for each of them, because then it's kind of easier the next time you're exposed to it and you understand it a little better, but don't memorize all those details. That is partly why I teach anatomy because it would drive me nuts when my anatomy teacher would say, oh, just memorize everything. It's like, uh-huh, great. You just put my anxiety through the roof. And so I want to be very, very specific. That's why I got these term lists. I want to be very, very specific what I am asking for you from you. And if you don't know, and if you don't remember or so, reach out to me, don't torture yourself. Just ask me, shoot me a text or a pronto message and just involve me in your process so I can decrease your anxiety as much as possible. If that's a problem you have, I have that problem. I'm a pretty anxious person. So I will understand if you have it too. So don't feel shy about that. That, that little cartoon I sent, the blood episode, there's a three or three episodes that are eight minutes long is extremely helpful. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if I can, uh, if I have to, really to put great. it into the system now, into the canvas, but but if you all go to, to Raphael's um, 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 Padlet post, you're going to get the link there of the whole, of all those videos, right? Yeah, it's a, play, it's a YouTube playlist. It's accessible to everyone. You can watch it on your phone. You can, the blood one is like ridiculously helpful because you're going to put like pictures of weird little cartoon characters on all those names. No, it's perfect. I mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think, where do I put them in? And I'm like, I'm thinking of putting them in like even before my videos, you know what I'm saying? Just like watch this first to get an overview of everything, you know, because it's also hilariously made and it's a really fun sort of old school cartoon, right? Like, uh, okay, so then uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the platelets and the platelets are little small fragments of blood. They're called thrombocytes if we use the technical, technical terms. And those are involved in um, patching up the, the breakage in the vessel wall if, if they break. And so, you learn a little bit about that. And then we go into blood plasma. 
and blood plasma is mostly water and some of it is dissolved substances. We have a lot of proteins from those. And then we also have things like nutrients, vitamins, hormones, and so forth, and some salts. And so it just talks about those different things. And here it talks a little bit about how Im uh, immunoglobulin and antibody. We know a lot about that since COVID. Everybody seems to know a lot about antibodies and antigens since COVID. But the antigen is what makes us sick. It's a marker on the pathogen, on the virus or the bacteria. And the antibody is what attacks that um, antigen it neutralizes the pathogen. And so that's where those terms come in. Immunoglobulin is the same as an antibody. And we got five here that we, um, immunoglobulin G, A, M, and E, and D, uh, that we describe or that are mostly described. You know, it's, I always say mostly because I, I never know if this, because this list is most likely not complete. It's just what we know at this point or what we are taught to teach at this point. Um, but they are like the white blood cells. They have different functions a little bit and are found in different, um, in different things like salivas or in, or in different fluids like lymph or so um, forth. Okay, and then we talk a little bit about the transport between oxygen and carbon dioxide. Most oxygen is transported on the hemoglobin. Most carbon dioxide is transported in the blood itself. And so it's not just a back and forth, the same is to the same from that. It's just the oxygen. Well, the carbon dioxide is the byproduct of the oxygen being used up. And so the oxygen we want to bring to the tissue and the carbon dioxide we want to bring away from the tissue. And then we talk a little bit about blood groups. And that's your A, B, or O, positive or negative blood type. And so you just go through that. We don't have an exercise on that uh, in this short semester. In the larger semester, I do have more exercises that solidify the information a little bit more. But if I make you do those, you're just gonna hate me. It's a lot of stuff already. So if you have a hard time understanding this material, but you are interested in it, the fall and the spring semester has more things that make it real life based um, and apply applied into the real world. Okay, from there we go into the immune system and uh, the immune system is very interesting. The first part of the immune system is non-specific. Um, that means it just gets rid of things that come in from all different pathways. We can cut the skin, we can breathe something in that's not good, we can eat something that's junk, funky um, and the non-specific immunity attacks that as a general foreign body. A lot of that has to do with fever, for example, inflammation. And, and, um, and from there then it, well, and actually the first thing it has to do is fend off the invaders. So the skin is actually an immune organ by not letting pathogens in, it's a boundary. And so that's the first line of defense. And then the non-specific immunity is almost like the second line of defense. And then from there, we go into the specific immunity and the specific immunity has to do with those antigens and those antibodies that I was talking about. And so they, antibodies attack, or then also the T cells, which are the cells that are really like sharp shooters in the real world. They, they have what they call perforin proteins and those are like bullets and they penetrate the bacteria, for example, and shoot it down. And if the bacterial wall is compromised, the bacteria is no longer viable and cannot survive. And so there's some really cool stuff in here. And I'm sure the cartoon does a fantastic job, Raphael, right on that. Yeah, absolutely. Posted it in the chat again. Yeah, yeah, please, please do though. Yeah, because I'm very, I was very impressed and laughed a lot when I saw it. Um, and then here it says major histocompatibility complex. And this is a system that when, when we look at like a T cell that needs to attack a foreign invader, it's very important that that T cell knows whom not to attack and whom to leave alone. And the histocompatibility is, is, a, is, is, is a, that complex is a surface protein that is a marker that indicates all the cells that belong to you. 
that we do not want to attack. Is that what happens when you get a, a, a graft? Like the problem of, is it, it when someone gets a, attach a new hand or new organ? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly the problem. The body doesn't see that MHC. And it, and it basically sends the molecular alarm all the time. It's like, oh my God, this is a foreign thing. We got to attack it. That's why when you have immune transplant people, their immune system is really low because you have to suppress it. Otherwise it will reject it all the time. And so that has to do with that. Also, this, when this goes awry, that's when we have autoimmune diseases. When the body, when the cells, the, the, the immune cells cannot understand who is ourselves and who is foreign, and then they attack our own cells and they destroy tissue that way. And there's a lot of autoimmune diseases, like you know, rheumatoid arthritis even is an autoimmune disease, for example. So and that's very interesting stuff when you go deeper into the studies. Go ahead. AIDS, I was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we have the specific immunity, and the specific immunity is T cells. Those are those sharpshooting kind of type cells. Also, um, um, helper cells also are in there. Um, so we got to talk a little bit about them. The T helper cells, for example, T suppressor and then T killers. So those are specific cells that attack pathogens on the, um, and coordinate that attack process because you know there's so, such a delicate process. We have the helpers that help understand and coordinate the immune attack and then also suppressors that you know try to calm down the sharpshooter and say like it's okay you can leave them alone now we've already attacked them you don't have to go overboard so that kind of stuff and then the b cells are the other types and the b cells are the ones that create the antibodies and antibodies are proteins they're not cells themselves they're free floaty things that can let's say they can attach themselves to an antigen exposed from a pathogens and 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 render that pathogen harmless for example through that process so you learn a little bit about that. That's pretty cool stuff. And then from there, we go into active and passive immunity and that's where we get immunization, for example. We get, and to me, this is one of medicine's greatest gift to humanity is that understanding and then that, um, that, that giving the body immunity by, and the reason why I say that is because it, it helps the body use its own mechanisms to defend against pathogens. And so, you know, we can argue about are these safe or not safe, but you know, most of the people that are anti-vaxxers, I ask them about mRNA and what is it? And they have no idea what it is. And so I'm like, well, first let me explain to you what it is. And then we can talk about if you like it or not. Um, and I'm not either or, I'm not gonna try to convince anybody. I'm just saying, we have to be careful. You know, people are just speaking out there the rectal sphincter kind of thing. Sorry, my language. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. They <laughs> first better learn what they're talking about. <laughs> then we have a conversation about it. So, you know, at, at this point, you're going to be in the inroad. You will know more about it. And that's very, you know, helpful. And then you can make up your own mind, but you don't just listen to somebody and, you know, blindly. But anyway, when it comes to immunity, we have the body's innate immunity, and then we have this learned adaptive immunity. And that's where we get into, we can do that naturally. We can actively, for naturally means we get an infection, we get a disease, we get COVID, and then we have some immunity for it because our body has the ability to create these antibodies. And the body also has the ability to have memory of these antibodies. And that's pretty cool. Or we can get this natural immunity passive. For example, when the baby has breast milk, that baby is protected from the diseases that the mom is protected from, at least while the baby is taking that and while the baby's body is growing and has the ability to learn its own, its system has the ability to start learning how to defend against the things that come at it on its own. And so that's passive natural immunity. And then we have this artificial one. One of them is immunization. That's when we sort of give the body a substance that is, you know, has a little bit of an antigen looking thing, but it's not making us sick the same way. Maybe a little bit because the immune system responds and it gives us this ability then to have this immunity. And when I say immunity, it doesn't mean that the pathogen doesn't get into our body, but it just means that the body is ready for it. 
And the thing is when the body has to learn it the first time, it's delayed. It takes time for the body to understand. It's like, oh, that's a foreign thing. Let's figure out how to make something against that. That takes a few days. When we are already been exposed and we have a secondary exposure to something, or we have an immunization of that thing, for example, then the body's already ready for it. And within no time, it can create these antibodies and can say like, hey, let me do the fixing. And when we look at this newer technology with mRNA, we basically, an mRNA from the cell chapter, remember, is a messenger RNA. It's a part of a DNA that then feeds into the ribosomes and makes specific proteins. And so an mRNA vaccine already gives the cells the code to make those proteins. And so that's why that's been an interesting study. It's been an you know, interesting development. It came from the AIDS pandemic, by the way, that starting that development of that, um, that form of immunization. Uh, but of course, it's also very fresh and very new. It's not that same old way where we, we in, a, in an older type vaccine where we have an attenuated virus, for example. We have a chickenpox virus that is not making us sick, but exposes our immune system to that antigen, to that part of the virus that will, will trigger the immune response. And that's a much longer process for the body to learn that than if we just give it the mRNA, for example. Now, we don't know how long that lasts. Maybe it's not as long lasting. You know, there's a lot of unknowns for it. But um, I would definitely question if somebody tells us that it's going to embed a chip in our DNA. So that, that one, to me, is a little bit foreign. But enough of that. And then the, the passive artificial immunity is like, let's say you get a snake bite and you get an anti-venom. And those are specifically directly antibodies that we we give to the patient so as long as and, and and that immunity is not long that immunity just lasts as long as those antibodies are around it doesn't teach the body how to make its own antibodies it just is somewhere where we need to have a quick response because you know a, a snake bite can kill you and so we need an anti-venom to immediately neutralize that that toxic thing anyway that's where we got that a little bit extra and then we talk about lymphoid organs what are they we talk about those are organs of the lymphatic system we talk a little bit about the thymus uh which is which is behind the sternum, which is where we develop we which we're actually where we teach the cell the mhc the mhc and so every cell that um, is exposed in the body has to go through that process the thymus is something that seems to deteriorate as we get older and is less needed. And by teenage-ish type years, it shrivels up a little bit. Although I've also read articles where bicycle people who bike, bike and some sports that keeps the thymus more alive. I'm not, you know, don't really understand the process, but that was interesting. Um, and then we talk about lymph nodes, which we've already mentioned in the lymphatic system. That's a place where we have a lot of uh, immune cells. It makes sense. You know, the, 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 the pathogen goes through the blood system and then it goes into the tissues and then the lymphatic system picks it up. And that's a great place to shoot it down. It has to funnel through lymph nodes. Um, and then we get a little into the spleen and then into mucous membranes, the tonsils and that kind of stuff. And just have a little blurb on it. Not that much, but I want to make sure you associate that with each other. And then, um, and then we get into the gut too, a little bit. The gut is, a, you know, a lot of pathogens come through the stomach as we eat stuff that, you know, has diseases in it. And so the gut is a very, very big place for having an immune function. Uh, and so we talk briefly about that. And then from there, as I'm running way over time, I'm sure, oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry about that. The endocrine system is kind of like a messenger system um the hormones are like the nervous system the nervous system talks very fast to our body and we can react to a hole in the floor so, or you know so we don't fall through it or we don't trip the immune the hormone the endocrine system um works much slower but it's more ongoing in processes like things like growth uh for example things like metabolism things like uh Many other things. <laughs> Can't keep my brain straight, like night and day cycle, for example, um, or also the use of, of energy, the, the adrenaline thing, 
uh, is also in the endocrine system. And so we talk about the different hormones uh, types. We have water-based hormones and we have fat-based hormones. Um, and then we talk about how, uh, how the body recognizes when do you release a hormone, when do we need a hormone. That's, that's kind of interesting. That's where the hypothalamus comes in. The hypothalamus is part of the brain. Uh, and so the brain is connected to the endocrine system. So they work together. And that's also a linchpin where we have these pathologies that are sort of like mind induced a little, the psychosomatic. Soma means body and psyche means, you know, thinking and brain stuff. And so that's where that is kind of interesting. And then we talk about the different glands. We talk about the pituitary gland, which sits right at the base of the, of the, of the brain. It's, that's what's attached to the hypothalamus and then the brain and that influences a lot of hormones we talk about the pineal gland that used to be the third eye in in the greek or um, egyptian mythologies and that's behind the, that's inside of the brain the pineal gland we we learned that when we talk about the brain the thyroid gland which is uh, old in old days we used to have goiters because uh, people have a lack of iodine and so that, that, that then it makes a lot of thyroid hormone, which has to do with metabolism, how we use the food uh, in our system uh, often, uh, for example. And that's actually why we have iodinized salt, because that way we secure that people have enough iodine and that way the thymus works properly. So that's, or the thyroid, sorry. That's an interesting place to learn uh, how, you know, as a public health, we try we try as much as we can to, to do things that are positive, like, you know, we put calcium into things or, or, we, or we put iodine into the salt. So the thyroid works well in most people, because if the thyroid doesn't work well, it's a really hard, it's, it's a really big contributor in gait, weight gain. And so if somebody has a really hard time losing weight, of course, if they're just sitting around and not doing anything and think that I'm watching sports means I'm doing sports, we have to have that conversation. Or if the food is only sugar-based or fat-based, we should have that conversation. But the thyroid also has a big component. And if somebody has a hard time losing weight, then please look at the thyroid gland and see if that's not functioning as well. Then also the calcium uh, in the blood is also controlled by, by a gland. And that's um, glands that are right around the thyroid that's in our in our chest in our neck area the lower neck then we talk about the adrenal gland a little bit that's the partly that's the adrenaline that goes out of there but also other things aldosterone cortisol you know cortisol from cortisone people get cortisone injections when they have inflammations in the joint for example cortisol is that natural long-term decrease inflammation but also immune system but make us function better substance and so that's what was in there and from there we go into the pancreas the pancreas has to do with sugar how do we use the sugar that's where the insulin comes from that brings blood sugar down but also the glucagon which brings blood sugar up if we have low blood sugar is in there so that that's an interesting this is a very interesting picture where you can see the negative feedback loop because if you have too much sugar, you release one hormone that brings the sugar down. If you have too little sugar, you release another hormone that brings the blood sugar up. So that's a good show of the negative feedback system. And then lastly, the gonads, very little on that, but um, none of the less is very important. But we have a whole chapter on the reproductive system. And then lastly, the smallest chapter of this uh, topic of this week is the integumentary system, and that's the skin. And so we just talk about what is the skin do? We have two layers of the skin. We have an epi, epi in Latin means above something. So the epidermis with different layers because those cells, they first are real cells, they have to grow and then multiple layers of squamous cells. And at the end, the top layer is basically dead cells that can fluff off if you bang into something. And thank God we do that. That way we don't bleed every time we bang into something. And so, you know, they have to give all the stuff different names. So you go through that, those names and learn a little bit about it. And then we talk about the underlying level under the epidermis. If the dermis, that's how the, the top layer of the skin is attached to the deeper body. And so we talk a little bit about those things there. And then um, the functional skin, many functions. We have um, 
thermal regulation, we have protection, we have immune function, meaning it's a boundary, things don't just come in. Um, temperature, you understand, you either shiver or you sweat, and that's the different way the body can control uh, can control heat a little bit because the inside of the body always needs to be the same temperature. So that's actually quite a big of a job. Um, water balance as well, sweat secretion, et cetera. It's a sensory function. A lot of the sensory receptors are in the skin that give us a touch or temperature or pressure or pain. And by the way, pain, this is very, very important because our, our medical system is a bit troubled in that way pain is not a vital function pain is not here something that we just need to get rid of i know it's uncomfortable but pain is basically the body telling us the body's language to tell us something is wrong and so if you hurt your back and you just take an ibuprofen you go running again now it might help because motion does help but if it's dangerous if it's broken it might also make it worse and so you got to be very gentle about that. You know, on one hand, you don't just want to shy away from activity if you hurt yourself. But on the other hand, you also have to be very careful to just push through it and think, ah, I can just push through it. And then 10 years later, you got arthritis and you go like, why do I have that? I don't know. Well, because you didn't listen to your body. And so that's a food for thought a little bit, you know, uh, there. And of course, I'm a chiropractor body worker. So I think about that all the time. Also, skin has to do with communication. You can be blushing or you can turn pale, depending on what happens on the inside. And then from there, we talk about skin appendages, and those are the hairs and the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands is that oily stuff, the oily, uh, uh, the oily part of the hair that comes out of every hair. We have a little oil. That's just the lotion. Body, it's about the body's own lotion, basically. Good. All right. That was a speeding. Oh, and the nails, of course. The nails are also body appendages, uh, skin appendages. All right. So that's been it. I don't know. It's a lot of material, but you this this week should be less troubling than last week in terms of how much terminology you need to learn. You have any questions to this or comments? Not really. Good. All right. If that's the case. I'm here for you guys, text me. I'm gonna also, Rafael, if that's okay, put that YouTube link in an announcement. Do it, so good, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, it's good, exactly. And with that, I wish you guys a wonderful week. The, the one on the immune system is really cool too. Anyway, it's, it, it, I, I just, it's, I can't believe I've been watching this as a kid. And it, for some reason they made it, that kids love it. Oh, that's, you know, it's a very, very smart, it was a very smart move, whoever did that. Because you want to you wanna explain this stuff to the kids so they learn about their body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then they have a foundation on it. And then when you learn it later again, well, you plug in the words, you go a little deeper, you go a little more. I remember the faces, whatever, the I remember the faces of the characters. I remember the, it's, it's crazy. The whole genome system, is, there's one on reproduction, on the creation, on, on mRNA. RNA and mRNA and how the and then chromosomes and it's really they have like little hats it's, it's it's stupid but it works so well it's crazy anyway well I know I know when it's good when I get up early in the morning and instead of reading some news shit I want to watch those then I know uh, it's good you uh, know yeah. it's not like a drag it's like oh no let me watch some of that <laughs> your daughter would love it I mean anything I remember watching it at the age of like seven eight nine ten eleven yeah 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 no that's yeah. wonderful no no that's wonderful. All right, man. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Take you care. Too.